Praise the Lord. I want you to turn, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I want you to turn to verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And Peter is speaking here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we have the prophetic word made firmer still. It's up on the screen. You will do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal, dark place until the day breaks through, the gloom and the morning star rises, comes into being in your hearts. Yet, first you must understand this, verse 20, and then 21 afterward that, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation, loosening or zobbing. For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes people think that we as Christians are believing myths, but God had prophesied where we stand today in 2011, thousands of years ago, that Jesus Christ would come to this earth. He prophesied that through his prophets. These prophets wrote it down. Someone says, well, man wrote the Bible. That's true. But they wrote what the Holy Spirit gave to them to write down for our learning, for our encouragement. And so, when people challenge you by your, uh, your faith, you tell them that it was written many hundreds of years in the past. It was prophesied by the prophets that Jesus Christ would be born on a certain date. You can study out the prophecies, and you will see that it was prophesied at the exact date that he would be born and that he would be crucified. And so when Jesus Christ came to this earth, when he was born in Bethlehem, and it was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem, that when he was born in Bethlehem, he grew up to be a man, and he came to this earth to die for you and me, for every individual. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So he comes, and he died on the cross, and took your sins all away. I thank God every sin that we've ever committed, when we come to Christ, it is taken away, and it is not remembered. Now, many times the devil will come and try to get you to remember about you. Remember what you did? God don't remember it. It's been taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how powerful the blood of Christ is. So we go back into the scriptures and we see that it was prophesied. So let's go back into the scriptures a little bit this morning and see uh, what happened. I want to bring to your attention that Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 states, and Isaiah prophesied this because God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, gave him these words. And this is what Isaiah says about this child. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For to us a child is born. And I'm reading from this, uh, from the Amplified. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From the latter time forth even forevermore. And who shall accomplish this? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Sometimes the enemy might come to you and put into your mind, well, you know, 
it's not going to happen. Jesus Christ is not going to return to this earth. He's not going to have a kingdom on this earth. And yet the Bible says hundreds of years, Isaiah was written 750 years ago, pinned this down that a child is to be born and a son is to be given. Jesus Christ gave his only begotten son. That's what John 3.16, if you look at that, to us a son is given, that's John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, we look and see that his government will be a government of peace, and it will, it will not end. So we look back and we see hundreds of years before Christ came and was born in Bethlehem, it was prophesied by the, the prophets of old. So Isaiah gives us a witness about that. But you go through the scriptures and you will see other men testifying. You will see that God himself will be testifying. Let me share just some uh, uh, fulfillment of scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> fulfillment of scriptures that have been fulfilled. All the way back in Genesis, the seed of the woman. We've all read the book of Genesis, and we see that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And that's what Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. And it goes all the way back in Genesis, thousands of years before Christ was to, uh, to be born. And so we see that prophecy. And I cannot give you all the scriptures, but that's found in Genesis 3.15, if you're writing it down. And... Uh, in fact, you can go ahead and put that up on the board if you want to. L listen to what it says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, he, that is Christ, shall bruise you on the head. That is, Satan's head will be bruised, and you shall bruise him on the he heel. That is, Satan will bruise Christ on the heel. So that prophecy, uh, when we celebrate Christmas... Remember, it was prophesied way back in the book of Genesis that it was to be so. We're so fortunate to live today and have the prophecies, have the Word of God as we study this, and you can go in, into, into the histories that even men have written and see many of these prophecies that have been fulfilled. Let me just share another one with you. Well, let, let me share Galatians 4.4 4 on that first one that... Uh, that the seed of the woman, Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Remember when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're still in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is fulfilling all the prophecies that told about his birth and everything that he would do, dying on, on the cross, ascending into heaven, seated up there interceding for us, all that was prophesied and it all came about just like the prophets said. Now here's what we got to do. We got to sit down and we got to, with that knowledge, we've got to say, wow, if all those prophecies about his first coming and he fulfilled, every one of them has been fulfilled, that is, up to that point. What about the prophecies in the near future? What about, what about the rapture? What about the second coming? What about the millennium years? What about the new heaven and the new earth? All of that has been prophesied in the Old Testament. So at this period of time, as we analyze as we meditate, as we read about these prophecies, and see that God fulfilled every one of those prophecies through Jesus Christ. Every dot and every tittle was fulfilled. Now, that's a, that's a perfect record. So we're not believing some myth. We're not believing something that man has wrote down to make us religious. No. God had the prophets to write these things down for our encouragement. So as we study the scriptures out, when I first got saved, when I was the age of 26 years old, 
I had no idea about how God did all of it. All I know is I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I didn't know nothing about Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or, or uh, Genesis 3.15 about the woman, uh, the seed of the woman would bruise, bruise the head. I didn't know none of that, and some of you didn't either. And yet I reached out in faith, and I believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Now, I'm going to give you a secret here. I didn't do that because I was so brilliant. I was so mental, knowing all the knowledge of God. In fact, I didn't know nothing but one thing. I was a sinner, and I needed to be saved. And I accepted Christ into my heart, and my life at that point began to change. I began to walk with God. Can you explain that? Well, uh, Jesus said, except a... Uh, a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And before that, I knew some scriptures, very little before I was saved. But when I was saved, I knew that I knew that I knew in my spirit. And, the, and then later on, as I studied the word of God, I began to understand a little bit about what the Holy Spirit did in my life. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if you don't have that experience in your life today, maybe you're not saved. Because the Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. That's what the Bible says. So here I am, I'm ignorant about all the scriptures, and I begin to study the scriptures, and I begin to study the prophecies of, 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 in the Old Testament. That everything that Jesus was to do and is going to do yet has been prophesied in the Bible. And as I begin to read that, my faith began to grow. I begin to see the awesomeness of this salvation. Let me just move on a little bit here and, uh, and share something down the line now. As you follow the uh, genealogy of Jesus all the way down to Joseph, it goes in back in the Old Testament, and I cannot share all of these scriptures <coughs> There's too many of them, but I'm going to begin to share with you. He was the sentence of Abraham. Abraham all the way down through to Joseph. He was in that line, uh, uh, and, uh, right on down the line. And you'll see that in the scriptures as it unfolds. As you study the scriptures, you will see that from one generation to the next, the next generation carried the seed, the next generation carried that seed, the next generation carried that seed who was to be Jesus Christ all the way down to Joseph. He was the descendants of Isaac. Isaac was Abraham's son. Oh, there's so much I can share about, but I, I'm giving you a brief uh, a picture to, to encourage your faith. Uh, he was a descendant of Jacob. He came from the tribe of Judah. All this is laid out in the Bible. He fulfilled it all. He was a descendant of, of Jesse. Jesse was uh, David's uh, father. He was a descendant of King David. He will be a shepherd to his people. I shared this little story about the young boy had to learn Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And the Sunday school teacher gave him the homework to, to learn that. And he couldn't. He tried. He'd forget. So it, it came his day to stand up in front of the church. He says, he says, he, and, he, and he just, his mind went blank. Anybody ever done that when you got in front of people? <laughs> he couldn't remember it. He forgot it. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I need to know. Don't get confused if you don't know the whole Bible. Listen, if you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you know those basic principles, you know you've been born again because the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. You need to know more, but that's all you need to know to be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Powerful. You might not be able to explain it. All right, let's move on real quick. Like, uh, He will be the shepherd of his people. He will be the heir to the throne of David. He will, he will be anointed and eternal. He will be born in Bethlehem. 
Boy, that, that is amazing to see what God did to bring them from Nazareth, that is Joseph and Mary from Nazareth, all the way to Bethlehem for Jesus to be born in the little town of Bethlehem, just like the scripture said. In fact, I, I'm going to read that in Micah 5, 2. You can put that on the board, please, the screen. This is Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Epaphathas, now that's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Epaphathas, the reason they put that word in there, because there's two Bethlehems in Israel. And this one that he was to be born in would be the one that is closest to uh, Epaphathat. Too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler of, in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Now, when you read that, you understand that when I first read it years ago, I did not understand that, but I realized that Jesus Christ was with the Father way back in eternity eternities of eternities okay so you see in that and so we see in Luke 2 4 and 5 and Joseph also went up from Galilee that's on the board 4 5 and 7 from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem now that's amazing how God could move them at the precise timing for Mary to be there to give birth to Jesus in Bethlehem See, that's the hand of God. So when you study the scriptures, you see the exactness of God's sovereignty. Because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes, cloths and laid him in a manger. A manger is a trough. How many farm people do we have in here? Well, a trough, if you have a trough, you can put water in it, you put feed in it, the trough. So they cleaned it all out, put some hay in there, and, and that's where they laid Jesus, in that manger, in that trough, okay? And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. All right, let's move on. The timing of his birth, the timing of his birth, you'll find it in the Old Testament. And I could read all the scriptures, which is found in Daniel 9, 25. You don't have to turn there. And you see Luke 2, 1 through 2. All right, let's move on. To be born of a virgin. To be born of a virgin. Child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Put that on the board if you don't mind, uh, Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, 14. That's a powerful verse of Scripture. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman who is unmarried and a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with man or God with us. Now, that prophecy was 750 years before Mary conceived. Five, 750 years, Isaiah uh, preached, uh, prophesied that in the Word of God before, before uh, uh, she was conceived. Okay? Uh, he was to be worshipped by the shepherds. You know the story of the shepherds. He was be honored by great kings. He was, uh, that particular time, they slaughtered, they slaughtered the children. That was all prophesied in the Old Testament, that these children, because that is Herod trying to destroy Jesus. And we know that an angel appeared to uh, Joseph and, and, and said, go to take my son to Egypt. And that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, as you read in the Old Testament, I want you to underline this in your mind. All the way from Genesis all the way down to the birth of Christ, you will see the devil trying to destroy the seed. All the way, all those hundreds of years, Satan tried to destroy that seed was, that was going to bruise his head and conquer him. He tried to kill the people that was carrying that seed. 
So when you study the Old Testament, you'll see that all the way down the line. Even when he was born, Satan, through Herod, tried to kill the seed that we would not have salvation. That's a powerful thought. Very, and then e even as Jesus started his ministry, you will see those three and a half years as he ministered on the earth, how Satan tried to kill him. It's amazing. I could say a lot about that because uh, he was to die. But not before he got on that cross. He got on that cross. He took the punishment upon himself. He took those stripes on his back that we might be healed. He provided salvation for us. And then he gave up his spirit himself and his body died when he gave up his spirit. So when you read and you see how all this will blend together, it will strengthen your faith. The flight to Egypt, you remember that? The angel came to Joseph and they, they fled to Egypt. John the Baptist came on the scene. The way prepared, John the Baptist, that was prophesied in the Old Testament, proceeded by the forerunner. Uh, Malachi 3 1, I'm going to read that. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then we see in Luke 7, 24 through 27, And when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the multitudes about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So when you read about John the Baptist, John the Baptist was uh, prophesied way back over in the Old Testament, uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, and, and then, it came, then he came forth in Luke. All right, he, preceded, he was preceded by Elijah, declared the Son of God. You know, some people will come to you and say, well, he was not the Son of God. But you know, when someone says he's not the son of God, you know what that person is doing? Calling God a liar. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And some little speck of sand comes along and say, no, that's not true. Well, he's calling God a liar. And God is not a man that he should lie. Remember when up on the holy mountain when the voice came from heaven and, and it said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? Remember at the water baptism when John was baptized in the Lord, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So as you read the New Testament, a lot of things that you will read in there Jesus and, and these men of God are fulfilling, listen, fulfilling what the Old Testament spoke that these men and these uh, people would do. So remember that. And I mean, your faith, if you can comprehend it, your faith will be solid. How can somebody 750 years or thousands of years past tell what the future is? So when you read the scriptures and you read in the gospels that everything that Jesus did, John the Baptist did, a lot of these different people did, was prophesied in the Old Testament. So why would we question anything in the near future? For example, the rapture, which is basically the resurrection. If all of those prophecies had been fulfilled exactly and we just looked at the little bit of future we have in the uh, near future about the rapture, the second coming of Christ, and then the, the 1,000 years, the millennium years. 
that Jesus actually will rule on this earth and then the new heaven and the new earth. I look back and see all that has come about exactly like the prophet spoken. I don't doubt in my mind what he has spoken now in the near future. Future is going to come about exactly like the prophets spoke. Nail that down. All right? He have a Galilean ministry. He ministered in a given area there of Galilee. He, was, he spoke in, in parables. All that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Temple becomes a house of merchandise instead of prayer. We know how Jesus went into the temple. He sort of cleared house, clean house, didn't he? The zeal of Jews for the temple instead of God. They had a zeal for the temple more than their zeal for God. We could have a zeal for a lot of different things more than we would have a zeal for God. So we need to check our own lives out in that area and make sure, number one, the Lord in our life. He's number one. He's priority. And what he desires in our life is number one. I like this one, a prophet. He was a prophet, yes. He was a prophet, he was a teacher, but he was the son of God. He was the savior of the world. In fact, let's put Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, declared to the Israelite people and to us today. Here's what it says, Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, that is like Moses, from among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. And then in Acts uh, 3, uh, 20, 22, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed to you, Moses said, the Lord shall rise, raise up for you a prophet like me, that is like uh, Moses, from your brethren. To him you shall give heed in everything he says to you. So we see that uh, uh, this prophecy that Moses spoke, came true, and it, it, it's, it comes out in Acts 3, 20, 22. All right. It talks about in the Old Testament, Isaiah, we won't read all that, but the blind, the deaf, the lame are healed by the Messiah. We go and study the three and a half years of Jesus Christ walking on the earth as the Messiah. He healed people. He healed the lame. So he was a healer. All right, this, this, the Messiah, it goes on, will be meek and mild. He was a meek man. He was mild. He humbled himself to the point in which he suffered the death on the cross. You know, when you see the picture of the cross, I know a lot of times we see, you know, maybe he has a scarf over his, his uh, partly over his body, but he was naked on that cross. He was naked on that cross. You're talking about humility. You're talking about shame. Can you imagine any one of you, we strip all your clothes off and we nail you to a cross in front of this congregation and everybody's gazing at you and you have no clothes on? Think about that. Put yourself in Jesus' place. Now, he did that for you. How many in here is modest? Let me see you besides me. Especially when I was a little boy, I was modest, very modest. Married, uh, Susan, I'm not going to put this, I don't know. <laughs> I'm moving on from that. But what I, see, I, I think of that, 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 that none of us like to be put to shame. None of us like to be embarrassed. He was embarrassed. He was put to shame. He was spit upon. He was whipped with a, a cat of nine tails, had nine lashes on it, and on each end of the, the little uh, whip, there was a piece of glass or a piece of metal that cut into his body. He, they stretched him over to the point. When they come down with that, with that whip, that thing went around his back and into his gut, and they pulled it, and they ripped his stomach right out to where his guts could be seen. That's what he did for you and me. And for me, now I'm talking about myself, for me not to follow him, for me not to obey him, shame on me. God forbid that I should ever complain. 
I tell Susan, it, you know, if I complain, you can hit me in the head with the frying pan. I don't complain no more. When you've been, when you've been hit once or, look at Susan, bless her heart. Susan says, scratch that, okay. I'm just kidding, darling. You know, when you've been married along, you can read your, eye, your wife's eyes, huh? Like television. <laughs> Boy, sorry. All right. He will minister to uh, the Gentiles. Oh, we've got scriptures on all of this. To bind up. To bind up the brokenhearted. How many people? How many times we've been brokenhearted, and he, he has bound us up. He has healed us of a broken heart. Intercede for the people. All that's in the scriptures. The Old Testament, it, he fulfilled it. He's fulfilling it now. Part of his ministry in heaven is interceding for you and me right now. I've, I've, gone to, I've worked so hard at times. And Susan may have been people that would work seven, uh, seven uh, I'm trying to think of it, 724 almost. And I just, I'd kneel at, the ta at my bed and i say, Lord Jesus, Pray for me tonight. <laughs> and I just fall over in the bed and go to sleep. How many's ever been there, you know? Yeah, I've been there. I've been down visiting people in the hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning and things like that, and you don't get to sleep sometimes you'd like to. But he gives rest to our souls. He gives rest to our souls. That's all in the promise. Rejected by his own people, the Jews. You know, to be rejected by someone that you love, now, let's meditate on that, children of God. To be rejected by somebody that you love and you are giving your life for, that is a deep wound. Is that not true? Come on, respond to me. Nod, move your lips. I can read lips. All right. I I'm telling you, that... Every one of us need to be accepted. That's one of the elements that, that God has, has, has put into every human being. We have to be accepted. We have to be loved. We have to know who we are. And when those things are taken from us, we don't know who we are. We're wondering down here, where am I going? Who am I? I know where I'm going. I know who, whom I have believed in. I know what he's prepared for me in the future, and it's exciting. But to be rejected by your own people, to be rejected by your own mate or your own children, that's a deep wound. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But he was rejected by his own people, the Jews. And I have scripture on all of that. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, that's what he is. He made a triumph entry into Jerusalem. He entered the temple with authority. He was adorned by infants. Many people did not believe that he was the Messiah. He was a sheep of the shepherds that was that was the sheep that was scattered. He was a shepherd to those that were scattered. He was betrayed by a close friend. Now, boy, that's another bruise, isn't it? To be betrayed by a close friend. And he was betrayed by one of his own disciples, Judas. Betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. I want to try to keep this positive, positive but uh, I see people, you know, the Hebrew writer says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This is a great salvation that God has provided. And, 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 the, and the Hebrew writer says, how shall we escape if we neglect? And I really pray that in 2012, and I'm not saying that many of you are not, you're solid on, in faith, and remember this message is going around the world. That's a powerful thought. This message is going to Russia, China, every nation. I'm speaking to the nations right now. And you have a part in that. That's a powerful thought. 
And that's what Jesus said. This gospel will be preached to every nation, and then the end will come. Then he will come back. And we have a part, a little country church, preaching to the nations of the world. That's a powerful thought. So many people don't know these, these truths. Betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Hmm. Betrayal money used to buy potter's field. We know the story on that. Accused by false witness. Oh, that's a hard, that's a hard bruise. Have you ever been accused of something and you're innocent? Now, that's a hard one. That's a deep bruise. And people come into our churches, and we have to try to help them to get healed from a lot of these things that they've been hurt by. How many parents have been bruised and hurt by their children or their loved ones or their mates? We've all been hurt. We've all been bruised. But remember, as we put our faith in Christ, he will heal us of those hurts and those bruises. If we're willing to do our part and follow the instructions that you get from your teacher, you know, a lot of people come in here, they want to be healed and go back into the world and do their things, and it don't work that way. No, God wants to heal you, not to go back into the world. No, we have to stand fast in that liberty wherewith Christ has set us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. He was silent to the accusations. He didn't open his mouth. How many in here, I'm going to stay behind the pulpit. How many in here, old habits are hard to break. How many of you know I'm usually out there. How many in here have been accused of something and you didn't say nothing? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to look at it because there wouldn't be many hands raised, I don't think. I mean, somebody accused you and you're innocent and you know you're innocent and you've been accused day in and day out. How long can you take that? You've heard of me sending people to the moon. How many have ever heard me talk about sending people to the moon? How many of you have ever sent people to the moon? Yeah, I thought so. Some of you probably spent a cold winter on the moon. But, you know, you really feel like that sometimes. And that's okay. You're human. One of the biggest discoveries I made that I was human. I'm not, I'm not uh, excusing my weaknesses or my faults, but I've been around a long time. Everybody in here is human. Some folks don't think they're human. They're so spiritual. Yeah. Some of you are smiling at me. You know what I'm talking about. No, we're all human. Yes, sir. But to be accused of something you know you're innocent, and yet he opened not his mouth. Listen to this. He had, all he had to do was to say, Father, I've had enough of this. Let them all go to hell. Send me a regiment of angels and deliver me. He could have done that. The Father would have done it. Ah, I want you to think that love. Let me tell you something. The nails did not Hold him to that cross. The love that he had for you held him to that cross. Oh, if you could suck it in, if you could take it in. I'm talking about you, 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 every one of you. That's what held him to that cross. When I think of that, I say, oh, God. Help me, O oh Lord, to walk humbly and not open my mouth every, every time somebody points their finger at me and accuses me. Boy, that's a hard one. Men, is that hard? Hmm? Men, is that hard? I just want to see if you're awake. See, I can't see with my glasses. I don't know if you're out there unless you wave at me. Yeah, I see you. Okay, okay. All right. I, I, you, need, you need to take, you need to get, identify with this, what our Lord went through in, in your own experiences in life, the times that you've experienced these things. But he did it for the whole world. 
That's just a little bit. You can identify just a little bit with the Lord. Oh, this is a good one. Spat on and struck. Have you ever been spit on? One back there? Yeah, I have. That's why I carry my hanky. I think that's what happened in the hair on my head. When they, they spit on me. Is that what happened to Scott back there? <clears throat> <laughs> that's, that is a degrading experience to be spit upon. And yet, you are under such control of the Holy Spirit, you don't send them the, to the moon anymore. Now you know you've grown a little bit. So you never know how much you've grown until you go through the experience. And a lot of experiences that we go through is to show you your level of growth. Spat on and struck in the head. My, my father's in heaven. And I love my dad and I, forgive him. I, for, I have forgiven my father. But when I was coming up as a young boy, he would always thump me on the head. And mom says, why do you do that? Well, I want to see if he's ripe yet. You know, he's a farmer and he'd go out and thump watermelons. That's humiliating. He's seen if my, if I, if my head, my water, me, my head's a watermelon. He's seen if it's ripe. If it's ripe, what you going to do, Dad? Cut it, eat it, you know? I didn't know, you know? Those are humi humiliating experiences, and yet Jesus Christ was spat on and struck. Now, all that was prophesied in the Old Testament, and, it, and he fulfilled it down to the dot in the New Testament. He was scourged, or he was whipped. He was the sacrifice he was crucified with, with two thieves on both sides. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Pierced through hands and feet. Prophesied in the Old Testament, he fulfilled in the New Testament. Sneered and mocked at, was reproved. People shook their heads. They, they gave him vinegar for his thirst. He prayed for his enemies. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you can grasp this, if you can grasp just a little bit of it, you, you can really sense and feel just what he went through for you and for me. That's powerful, powerful thought. Soldiers gambled for his clothing, forsaken by God, committed his spirit to God. Friends stood afar off. No bones were broken. His side pierced. Darkness over the land. All of these things that I'm saying was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Is this a coincidence? Some great brain has to come? This must have been a coincidence. Well, that God needs an overhaul in his brain. No way in the world could man prophesy these things. Only God knew what the future is. And so as we study this out and see what Christ did and, and he fulfilled all these prophecies, just remember of the prophecies yet to be fulfilled in our lifetime, we will see them and they are being fulfilled. I'll give you one right off the hand. Israel becoming a nation. That was prophesied all through the Bible. In the Old Testament, in 1948, they became a nation. In our lifetime, we saw that fulfilled. And I could go on and on with that, but that just gives you an idea that in our lifetime, we're seeing these prophecies being fulfilled. He was buried with the rich, and he was to be resurrected. He sent the Holy Spirit. He established a new covenant. His ascension to God's right hand, that's where he's at right now. And the Gentiles will, will seek the Messiah. On and on we could go. I want to share this with you, and it goes right along. I think it's really good. Listen to this. And the title of this is, You Can Have My Room. Wally was nine years old and in the second grade, though he should have been in the fourth. He was big and clumsy slow in movement, 
and mine, but well liked by the other children in class, all of whom were smarter than he. At times, the boys did have trouble hiding their irritation when the uncoordinated Wally would ask to play ball with them. He would stand by, not sulking, but hoping, always a helpful boy, willing and smiling. The natural protector of any child he felt was being mistreated. At Christmas time approach, plans were made for the annual school pageant. <clears throat> Children were being assigned their parts, angels, shepherds, wise men, Mary, Joseph. Wally stood by expectantly, then suddenly his joy knew no bounds. For he heard the teacher say, Wally, I want you to be the innkeeper. Not many lines to learn, she reasoned, and his size would make his refusal of lodging to Joseph more forceful. Little did that teacher dream the lesson that such a tender-hearted boy would, would teach to all who would attend that program. Then came rehearsal. The manger, the beards, the crowns, the halos, and a stage full of squeaky voices. Most caught up in the magic of the night was Wally. He would stand in the wings, watch the uh, performance, and was fascinated. His teacher had to make sure he did not wander on stage before his clue, before his cue. Came the long awaited night, and Wally stood holding a lantern by the door of the inn watching as the children who portrayed Mary and Joseph came near him. What do you want? We seek lodging. Seek it elsewhere. The inn is filled. Sir, we have asked everywhere in vain. We have traveled far and are very weary. There's no room in this inn for you, Wally. Look sternly. Please, good innkeeper. This is my wife. She is heavy with child and needs a place to rest. Surely you must have some small corner for her. She is so tired. Now for the first time, the innkeeper relaxed his stiff stance and looked down at Mary. With that, there was a long pause. The audience became a bit tense. No, be gone, he whispered from the wings. No, be gone, Wally repeated automatically. Joseph sadly placed his arms around Mary. Mary laid her head upon her husband's shoulder, and the two of them started to move away. The innkeeper did not return inside his inn. However, Wally stood there in the doorway, watching the couple. His mouth was open. His brow ceased with concern, his eyes filling unmistakably with tears. And suddenly, this Christmas pageant became different from all others. Don't go, Joseph, Wally called out. Bring Mary back. And Wally's face grew into a bright smile. You can have my room. A burst of laughter, then solace. Then tears flowed freely as the message came through to the listeners. Wally, the boy considered slow, had made room for Jesus. He could not turn Mary and Joseph away. God's only begotten son would be welcomed by him. His tender heart had made room for the Savior. Have you made room for him who loved you so much that he died on the cross? for your sin? If not, why don't you right now, like Wally, make room in your heart for Jesus. Then give him first place in your life. He is standing at your heart's door. Just invite him in. Behold, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. Let's pray. Father, you always put out the invitation.